All right. Hi, everyone. On behalf of HR.com, welcome to the webcast Designing for Belonging in a Hybrid World, sponsored by Propeller Consulting. It is now, without further ado, my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Alex Barra to get us started. Thank you so much, Rhonda. We are so excited to be with you all today. Um, as Rhonda said, I'm Alex Barra. I am a management consultant at Propeller, and I am joined today by my two colleagues, Zach and Amanda, who will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but just a little bit about Propeller Consulting. We are a people-focused management consulting firm that helps businesses thrive and change by delivering solutions that build momentum and drive impact within their organization. Uh, in short, uh, we're a company full of people who love the adventure of solving complex problems. And um, we have offices all over the place. Um, we are in Portland, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Denver, Minneapolis, and Dallas. Um, so uh, so kind of scaling across the US. So. Um, and uh, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about me personally. Um, I am very passionate about helping organizations and teams identify creative ways uh, to solve people and change problems that enable them to find efficiencies and um, allow them to truly adopt change. Um, and then some fun facts for you. Um, I was born on Long Island, New York. Uh, so if there are any New Yorkers, Nassau County in the house, uh, I welcome uh, I welcome any of those folks uh, to chime in. I have a border collie named Finn. He's a year and a half old and he is crazy. Um, and I'm also an improv and comedy performer. I've been doing it for a long time. And I also did it over Zoom uh, during the pandemic. And uh, with that, I want to pass it over to my co-presenter, Zach. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. My name is Zach Gallinger-Long. I'm a management consultant with Propeller, and I'm passionate about helping leaders improve team efficiency by strengthening, strengthening trust-based relationships and establishing a culture of people first. My fun facts for today, first off, I have two children, one in high school and one in college. Uh, second one, I'm currently training for a marathon, and my first marathon is coming up this coming Sunday, so I'm literally counting down the days. And third, next month I'll be traveling to Puerto Rico for a week to help rebuild homes that were damaged by hurricanes. Amanda, over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm Amanda, the Senior Marketing Lead at Propeller, and I am offering tech support today. Three fun facts about me are I am a huge animal lover. I have two dogs, two cats, and volunteer at rescues here in Denver regularly. Um, I'm a cultural mentor for refugees um, here in Denver. We have programs that help them um, assimilate once they get here, and so that's something I've been involved in. And I speak conversational Greek and I'm applying for dual citizenship there. Um, that, and that's my three facts, so back to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so now that you know a little bit more about us, um, I want to take us through our, our journey for today and what we're going to be covering. So we're going to start out with talking a little bit about COVID-19 um, and, and how our experiences varied, but it was very much a big change for, for most of us, if not all of us. Then we're going to go through uh, the hybrid work world, right? This new normal that we're all a part of and look at some of the insights that we've collected um, through survey methods, et cetera. Then what we want to do is we want to connect it um, to belonging. And, uh, and we'll do that using a um, bunch of research from the Stanford D School um, that they did in schools. So uh, super exciting uh, to go through that with all of you. And then what we really want to talk about and, and drive home is like the why, like why is this relevant for, for everybody, no matter where you sit in the organization. If you're CEO or you're an IC, this is all, um, all relevant, right? Um, so we'll, we'll go through that. We also want to do some case studies with you um, and figure out how to utilize certain levers of design to promote belonging. Um, and then, you know, we want to, we want to have you learn and apply. Uh, so, so you'll see some friendly uh, personas at the end that we will ask you, um, I'll, we'll ask you some questions about. So we're super excited uh, to get rolling. Of course, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, I want this to be very interactive. So if you have anything, like we'll definitely pause. Amanda will be the voice of our audience. And so, um, you know, she will let us know if we have questions and, you know, just keep it coming for us. Okay. So to get started, I think it's really important to acknowledge why we are here today and reflect on where we've we've come from. So in 2020, 
I remember I was coming home from a trip in Sea Ranch, California in March, and I was told by family, friends, etc., hey, you need to hit the grocery store before you get home because we don't know when you're going to be able to go to the grocery store again. Of course, hearing that, it's kind of crazy to just think that something that you do probably on a weekly basis is, you know, different or not not happening at all. And so when we got to the um the grocery store, it looked like this. And, you know, talk about otherworldly, right? I think that it, it, it's a scary sight to see this. And I think when I th I think about COVID-19, this was a shared experience that we've all gone through. Um, it fundamentally changed the world that we live in, how we interact with people. Um, it accelerated business uh, uh, digital transformation for our companies and our workplaces. Um, and, you know, it, it just it kind of just reshaped the world that we know it. Um, and so in like as that goes right, we're all searching for connection during this time. Right. We're stuck in the house. What do you do? Um, and I know for me personally, um, you know, doing Zoom improv, Zoom stand up, it's super hard to do that. But we all kind of needed some sort of outlet to to get us to where we, we needed to be. And um, I think a lot of new technology came out of this. So um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, there were little bots that were created so that people in nursing homes could talk to their families, right? Like this is, you know, they might not know how to use technology. And, um, you know, a lot of really good things came from this as well. I also just want to say like professionally, um, this was a big change for the organization that I worked in. I worked in manufacturing. Um, the culture was you got to be, uh, you got to be in your seat at your desk. I want to see you where you're working. And so uh, I was in the change management office at that time and having to help these managers who for 40 years have been coming into the office to be able to change their mindset to say, hey, you all can't come in now. Um, we have to work on this together um, and adapt. Um, it was really uh, a, a, like a case study in change management about how quickly people had to readopt. And so um, what I'd love to do is I'd love to hear, Zach, I'd love to hear your experience as a parent um, and also your professional experience with COVID-19. Certainly. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, for From the parent perspective, having two kids in high school at the time, it was a relatively easy transition to remote for them. They were able to self-manage that um, without much supervision, uh, like a, a younger child might need more assistance with that. Um, my wife and I certainly appreciated being able to close the laptop and be home right away and have more family time. We didn't miss our 45-minute commutes to work each day. Um, and from a prof professional standpoint, I was managing an international team at the time. So we already had elements of remote interactivity with some staff members. So transitioning to full remote wasn't that big of a leap for our team. Uh, and it actually put us into a good position to help other teams get up to speed faster on how to be productive and effective in a remote environment. And what I think is interesting between just even our two examples there, very different experiences. It's a shared experience that we've all been through the pandemic, but it's, uh, we've all gone through our own version of it. And as we think about the hybrid reality that we're in now, and as we move forward, it's, we should give ourselves some grace in understanding that we're still figuring this out as we go along, that there are still best practices to be uncovered, and we're going to continue to get better by learning from one another. And that's what we hope to accomplish today with our content. So speaking of our hybrid environment that we, we now find ourselves in, let's look at some insights on uh, how many people are in a hybrid environment and are we where we expect it to be. So according to research conducted by Propeller, we see 12% of respondents say that they're in a fully remote position, that they are not going into the office at all. But what's interesting is a year prior, 32% of respondents expected that they would be in a fully remote environment at this time. So we're seeing less people fully remote than originally anticipated or that they expected. And if we look at the next statistic, 69% of people say they're in some type of hybrid or remote environment currently compared to a year ago where 45% expected to be. So we're finding more people in that middle ground of hybrid, not fully remote, not fully in person in this middle ground. We're seeing a greater percentage than anticipated. Thankfully, 90% of people feel confident, confident in their ability to perform in this hybrid environment. But what's interesting is just like individuals' mindsets may have shifted from full remote to hybrid, we're seeing that with corporations as well. 
corp some corporations early on in the pandemic were quick to adopt a full remote policy, but we've seen those organizations shift more to the middle to account for the different preferences and working styles of their people that some are prefer remote, some prefer in person. We need to have this, this mix uh, somewhere in the middle as well. So it's great to know that we've got the tools out there, that people are feeling confident that they can be successful at their jobs. The question for leaders is, now that we are in this environment of somewhere in the middle, how do we instill this feeling of belonging when we're not all in the same place, we're not all in the same situation, and there's this, this middle area that we find ourselves in? So before uh, I move any further, I want to make a quick plug again for our ebook. Um, I know Amanda dropped the link earlier, but in case you missed it, we could drop it one more time. It has a lot of insights in there, a lot of great data and information, more than we're going to cover today. Be sure to follow that link for additional insights on, on working in a hybrid environment. Okay, so getting back to the point about belonging, how do we instill this spirit of belonging in a hybrid environment? Well, let's start by defining what belonging is. The dictionary definition is a feeling of being happy or comfortable as part of a particular group or having a good relationship with other members of the group because they welcome and accept you. That's the dictionary definition. We're gonna compare that against research that Alex is gonna share with us in a moment and compare it against individual definitions that uh, we've gathered as part of uh, preparing for this session. And we would like your input as well. So we've prepared a poll everywhere. If you text the word propeller to the number 22333 or visit pollev.com slash propeller, tell us in one word, what does belonging at work mean to you? And we'll see the results of that live poll in just a few slides. But in the meantime, Alex, what can we learn about design thinking from the Stanford D School research? So I think there's a lot to learn, um, especially I have been a D school fan for quite some time. And so basically I want to talk about a little bit of like the you know context of, of what it is. And so design thinking was created um, and kind of like championed by the Kelly brothers. Um, if anyone is uh, familiar uh, with IDEO, uh, they are kind of like the the school of thought on design thinking and do a lot of really cool projects. Um, and so the Kelly brothers took this new method of problem solving um, and put people at the heart of it. So you're not necessarily looking for the solution, like you're not trying to build the bridge to, you know, you know, over the path, you're really trying to get to the heart of like, how are people feeling? Like, what what are they doing? What are they saying? Like, how can we make this experience better for, for the people we're designing for? Um, and so um, Stanford University um, ended up making a school all kind of centered around design thinking called the Stanford D School. So um, it was founded in uh, 2004, and it is one of the hottest schools at Stanford. Um, people want to take classes. There's all sorts of things you could do, ex executive education. Like if you can take a Stanford D School course, like definitely do that if you have the opportunity. Um, and um, they also create kind of little um, research groups under the D school umbrella. And so um, in 2017, they created this K-12 lab, um, which really focused on children in schools and um, how do they create more equity equitable models in school and build creative confidence um, and teach kids that everyone can be creative. And um, just want to put a plug out. Um, one, one of the Kelly brothers wrote a book called Creative Confidence, which is a really good read. Um, it basically says that everyone can be creative no matter what. Um, so uh, definitely add that to your reading list uh, if you uh, would like to. So how does this all tie together? Uh, the K-12 lab did a study uh, into belonging in the classroom um, and and they wanted to see what an integral role it played in um, in how teachers and children show up at school. And so what the D school folks did um, was was they really thought about, OK, how can we design and create certain conditions so that belonging will develop in these schools and for these for these children? Um, so uh, they ended up coming up with um, a couple of, um, you know, major themes that they saw around belonging. So, um, so the dimensions, inviting and welcoming, right? Like, if we think about that when you're a little child, like, you want to be asked to come play Legos with, you know, come play Legos with me and, and feel like you're really welcome to, you know, bring your true authentic self. 
And then you want to know and accept um, that you are known and accepted, right? Like, I'm going to come as I am. I'm going to build my Legos. I'm going to do my thing. Um, and I'm going to contribute and participate, right? Like, that is so important. Like, I'm, I'm able to contribute to the success. And then I'm able to experience growth as a result of that, right? Maybe I would have learned how to do Legos in a different way. Or, um, you know, somebody might have taught me something different. But um, what's super interesting about this um, is that like a lot of these things that we see, um, you know, like they are very, very tied to the hybrid work, the workplace. Right. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind and I want you to really like soak these five in because they're going to be very critical as we, as we go on. So let's go into like, what is act, what does belonging mean? So Stanford D school did their own thing, but Zach and I, we did our own um, research, and what we ended up doing was we asked people um, in our in our social spheres, "What does belonging mean to you?" And so, what we have here is we have kids from age three to seven, and we also have some adults. Um, but what I would like everyone to do is just take a minute and look at this. And what are you noticing? Tell, tell us what are you noticing? What are you seeing? Um, you know, my personal favorite is belonging means love. It feels like a warm, like warm, like petting a llama. Like that's that's me. That sums up my sentiments as well, Alice. Um, but what do you all notice about these things? The word nice. Okay. Acceptance, caring for others, excellent. Comfort, safety, shared feeling, rejoices. Patient, understanding, support, understanding. I love it. This is great. They want to be here. Perfect. Amazing. Patient. Excellent. No expectation of perfection. Awesome. Um, so um, if we go to the next slide. Okay, this is what everybody said in their poll uh, everywhere um, in their one word. So um, so what we can basically say um, pretty confidently is that like adults and children have the same sentiments around belonging, just said in different ways. You know what I mean? Like, you know, one kid's going to talk about, you know, it feels like petting a llama, but then someone else is like, you know, I really feel accepted and like somebody has my back. It's the same sort of thing, no matter if you say it eloquently or not very eloquently. Um, you know, it's a universal a universal feeling. Um, so appreciate everyone's sentiments um, uh, and uh, participation in the poll EV um, poll. Um, and so now what I want to do is say, okay, why why should we care about this, Alex? Like, okay, we we talked about the D school, we talked about belonging and the hybrid work. Like, but but why does this matter? So, um, I think that if you if you think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, belonging is on there. And so um, that being said, like that that is just something that needs to be taken account in the workplace, in the hybrid work world, right? Um, I think another thing um, to really think about, um, and a lot of research has gone into this, um, you are more likely to actually have, um, you know, higher, higher levels of engagement when you feel like you belong. You're more likely to go to work. You're also more likely to like stay at your company, right? Like you're not gonna wanna leave somewhere where you feel like you have roots. Um, and feel like you like you belong there, right? Um, and then I think what that translates into, right? If you have highly engaged employees, that is going to kind of move the needle into your business results, right? So you're going to see lower turnover, higher sales, um, you know, more more interactions with it with colleagues, and like better like profit marginability as well. So I just think that it's it's really important for um for us to to think about there's a lot of things and variables that can affect um the bottom line of the business and belonging is definitely one of those things for sure. We have a we have a 
technical difficulty here. Sorry, guys. Trying to get that. It's stuck with the pull EV. Give me just a second. That is all good. While we wait for that, have there been any uh, questions that we've seen come through that we could work on? Let's Maybe we're going to answer a question live. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, this is a good one. Um, what are current best practices for measuring and recognizing belonging in an organization? Um, so I can actually take this one. Um, this, um, I would say surveys um, 100%. I think there are a lot of companies out there that can help to measure belonging kind of in their diversity, equity, and inclusion index that they have for their surveys. Also focus groups, like if you wanna, you know, Depending on like what how, how your company is structured, I think uh, you can always talk to people and say like what's going on. But I do think that some sort of um, integration into your um, into your annual survey process or your pulse surveys can give you a really good idea about how people are thinking or feeling about belonging and just making sure that you have the right questions, right? Like you're asking the right things. Um, and so I've seen a lot of. Um, of uh, of different ways of doing that within um, within just like my experiences with surveys, et cetera. So um, that that's what I would say um, because it's it's interesting because um, belonging is something that like you wouldn't necessarily like be able to measure until there's like a lack of it, right? Like we only really feel it when it's not there. Um, so you're gonna want to talk to your people in like a really genuine way. Um, and so finding moments to do that um, are those kind of best practice surveys, focus groups, et cetera. But I think the biggest thing that you have to do is once you talk to these people and you ask these questions, like you have to do something about it and be very public about it. That's great. There was a question that came in. How important do you think creating a sense of belonging really is to most employers or C-suite leaders? And I think what you've got here on this screen, that's very relevant. So if you want to talk further to that, Alex. Yeah, um, I think, you know, looking at this data, the, the proof is in the data points. I think it's, it is really um, like kind of a, a value add for people to embrace this. You know, will people embrace it? Yes, maybe no, right? But I think the biggest thing to take away from this is like you within your own teams, within your own ecosystems, like you can also like have an effect on your culture, on your workplace. Um, if you, you know, want to do certain things and make meaningful hybrid moments with your team, right? Like it doesn't have to necessarily come from the top, but what I will say is that it definitely helps um, because if you have people to model the walk um, and to show like what is expected, um, that is only going to bolster up the, you know, the cultural imperatives that like this is important. Um, you know, I like as a CEO, right? Like that that would be a beautiful way to do that. And Zach will talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. Um, so, uh, but, but great questions. The only other thing that I would say in answering that question of why would a business owner or C-suite, why should they care? Um, in today's environment, I hope that we're getting to a, a place where companies are thinking about people first and that they are coming uh, at designing for belonging in today's environment from a genuine desire to benefit people. And when you do that and you make that the forefront of your mission, that you want to better serve the people that are in your charge, that uh, byproduct of that effort will be the benefit to the business. And that's um, and, and that's where those stats come in. That's, that's what the benefit of the business to the uh, business will be but it, it comes from starting at a genuine place of wanting to care for your people. Awesome, thanks Zach. And so we've talked about kind of like the why, we've talked about the what, what is belonging, but now, now we're, how do we do this? How do we start creating um, meaningful experiences for folks? And so the Stanford D School actually um, brought together five levers of design. So these as well are super applicable to where we are in the hybrid workplace today. And so I wanna just say that I don't wanna focus too much on like the different tools and the actions that you can do. We have an appendix that you all will be able to take a look at to really figure out what would work for, for your organization, you know, thinking about prioritizing, et cetera. But we wanted to highlight the 
the kind of top two things that we've been seeing um, that work really well um, for, for each lever of design. So um, first and foremost, communication. Communication is really important. If you have people in the office or on on a, on you know Zoom for meetings, some really really good ways for you to do this is just to do a first five. What that means is take the first five minutes of every meeting to just check in with people. How are we doing? You could do an icebreaker. You could do whatever. How what did you do over the weekend? It doesn't matter. Just taking time to really getting get to know each other on a you know. Um, just being able to bring your whole self to work and say, hey, I went fishing with my partner or I went to a dance show or, you know, that can really, really help to build camaraderie and and belonging. Um, and then also like using inclusive language and like just including people in in your dialogue. Like, for example, it was really important for me and Zach to have Amanda with us today. Right. And for you to see Amanda and for Amanda to kind of be our voice of the audience, because um she is she's just as much on this stage as we are right like she's monitoring the chat she's doing the deck um so you know just just identifying and saying hey like we want to have you with us um and elevated is is some is a really easy way to be like you know just to just to recognize someone and be like hey like we want you with us um which um, is super easy and like not a very heavy lift. Um, so very happy to have you with us, Amanda. And also Rhonda, right? Like Rhonda's our HR.com partner. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, everyone is included. Um, two, objects. There we go. We got away from Rhonda. Um, objects. So something that I found works really well is um, a team mascot or some sort of team, you know, item that is like you could either you know make it up or it could be a meme it could be a gif like whatever you want it to be <laughs> um that has been something really amazing to drive community and um you know even having like emojis of that in slack like it's a it's a beautiful way um to to give homage to your team to your group to your organization like whatever you want to do um you know at, at kind of a lower cost um, also, I want to highlight the tool Kudo Board. Um, and if you know about Kudo Board, feel free to drop it in the chat. Would love to hear um, if you if you've used it or somebody has given you one. But it's a really easy way for you to um, to acknowledge your coworkers, whether it be for a wedding or a birthday or a service anniversary, or just to say thank you. Um, you know, you get this link. You can write a message to the person that it's for. You can add a GIF or a meme or like whatever you want to do. Um, and it's just a really nice way to just say, hey, we see you like we want like you're a part of us like we like you matter. Um, and it's it's low cost as well. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about space, too, because like we have to create space for these moments to be happening. Um, one thing that that we did um, were um we actually used confetti the company um and we did a uh drag brunch or not drag brunch uh just like a drag bingo uh event at propeller um that was amazing so like confetti will um will just like set up everything for you uh you can even choose like if you want it to be pg or pg-13 do you want kids there etc like um, so that company, if you're, if you have some budget, like I would definitely recommend, uh, confetti. We all had a wonderful time. Um, and then also like doing virtual game nights, um, I think are, are important too. Um, I also see that we have a question, Amanda, uh, where, what, what's our question? Absolutely. Uh, how do you balance the desire to support and care for your team's needs while upholding your company culture and client's needs? for in-person interaction? Ooh, that's a good question. I think in the case studies, we might touch on this a little bit. So let's hold on to that one because uh, I think we're about to get into that. So great, great timing. Yes, awesome question too. Um, and then just to go through the the last two as well. So you you have roles, right? Like you have informal and formal like hierarchies at work. Um, so you could obviously have management be very much like a like a, a a sponsor or steward for hybrid work, or like you could you could as your own team 
like very informally, like you could be that person too. So like, you don't have to be in a position of power to like, you just have to be able to like influence. So that's why we put here formal versus informal. Like there's a lot of different ways you can, you can, you know, create roles for folks, um, you know, whether it be in the organization or on your team. Um, and, uh, and there's some, you know, again, we have a lot of tips and tools, et cetera, for you all in the appendix that you all will, will get when the deck is made available. Um, and then rituals. Uh, this could be like a monthly team meeting. This could be a, um, a lunch event. Um, but two of the things that we've seen that work really well um, is actually the donut app. So if you have Slack, um, it's, an, it's an app that can be integrated into Slack. And it basically matches you up with somebody different every couple of weeks. And you could take time to get to know them. Um, and uh, and I've seen other um, organizations, excuse me, use Donut in a lot of different ways. I know that there was one company that used it, you know, had their CEO to like check in with with the people that worked for them. So um, you can be really creative with all of these things. Um, and then also like a Friday Digest. Um, I've seen um, a really great model of a leader um, basically doing a recap on a Friday and um and acknowledging every person for what they did that week and if maybe they were out there was still an acknowledgement in there so um i would love to know in the chat like what other things have you seen what has worked for you and your organization and obviously like um to, to the question that that y'all had in the chat um you know company culture matters too like it matters like what like you're not going to do something that doesn't make sense so i would love to hear from you all um, what what you all have been doing or have seen that works or what struggles you have. I see Johanna uh, posted um, a comment just to us as panelists saying teambuilding.com was helpful, a virtual art heist event of mm -hmm. solving puzzles. So that's a recommendation from one of, one of the attendees. Nice. Great. Okay. We'll keep those recommendations rolling in throughout. We're hoping to uh, go through that at the end and uh, add that to the resources that we provide to folks, we, we're here to learn as well. So uh, please keep those recommendations coming. Next, we'll move into uh, designing for meaningful moments. So Alex did a great job giving us some levers to consider. And now we're gonna talk about how do you map towards those uh, opportunities. We're gonna start, uh, we've touched on this a little bit already, but we're going to revisit it. You have to have psychological safety. You have to have safe spaces where people feel comfortable bringing their whole self to work. This uh, culture of belonging will help further facilitate that, but you have to have laid some foundation groundwork of trust for people to be vulnerable, be willing to share th their whole self with you um, in, in a work environment. So that's, that's key to anything else that we're going to cover in this presentation. Once that is present, you've got that foundation, we can start to map towards meaningful moments. And that can be uh, looking for intentional opportunities to celebrate somebody. Find a reason to celebrate everyone on your team not just for what they contribute to the business, but for who they are and what they're passionate about. And this has, has a positive impact on them as the individual, as well as colleagues who get to participate in the celebration of that person, bringing them into the group. We talked about that sense of, of being a, a team. We want to instill that belonging. So it, it has residual benefits uh, for the person who's being celebrated, but also those who get to participate in it. Um, and they can look at uh, an example might be when you've got a junior uh, staff member, maybe their uh, first job and that they're going to present to the company for the first time. That's a milestone for them. And you as a leader or a colleague have an opportunity to map towards that moment, come alongside them and make sure they feel confident and ready to go. And they're looking forward to the opportunity. They're not racked with uh, uh, anxiety about this uh, upcoming uh, delivery of a presentation that they feel supported that they know that their whole team is behind them and, and rooting for them. That's an opportunity to map towards a moment and and be there with the person in that moment. But it doesn't always have to be work related. It doesn't have to be a company milestone or a professional milestone. It could be a personal milestone. If they've shared something about themselves with you uh, that, that would be appropriate to celebrate, then find that opportunity to call that out and recognize that because it's important to them. Uh, next, consider those levers and angles. Uh, that can be collaborating with colleagues to understand what might be a thoughtful way to recognize somebody, getting other people's input on uh, ways to um, think about celebrating someone else. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll work on the exercise with Alex here in a moment, where we're all going to work on that. But uh, that leads me to my next point, and that's designing for 
and with the person. It's not, it doesn't have to be a secret meeting and then surprise, uh, we all came up with this idea. It should be mindful of the person you're celebrating. Not everyone is going to find the same things meaningful. So tailoring your focus around the person's preferences, what they're comfortable with and what's important to them is, is key in making sure that this is a, a meaningful gesture and that they're comfortable with it. And then lastly, helping people feel seen and accepted. So you as a leader should be demonstrating these qualities, looking for these opportunities to celebrate your people for not just what they do, but also for who they are and what, the, what excites them. And then bring other leaders along in that mission. Uh, have your team be the example for the company and start to, to uh, build that groundswell if it's not already a part of your culture. Uh, at, at your work, but uh, making sure that you recognize when people go out of their way to instill this sense of belonging. Each of those actions that you, when somebody steps out to uh, further support somebody, help them feel a part of the group, invite them to play with the Legos that we talked about earlier, each of those is a deposit into a piggy bank. And, and that, that's an emotional piggy bank that adds to that culture of belonging. We want to make sure that we're constantly making those deposits. And even the slightest um, actions really do add up to a large balance. So uh, let's get into some case studies. Let's see what this looks like in practice. We've actually got some real world case studies here pre prepared for you. Exactly. We've got a couple of comments and a question. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Uh, one was critical to connect outside of work, uh, not just in a, in a social setting. And then another one is before I started with my current company, my buddy asked me to talk. She asked about me, what I like, how I like to learn. It was super meaningful and allowed her and my team to design for my onboarding appropriately. Mm. I thought that's you wanted to add. And then I if we could just take a moment to pause on that one, just to dive a little bit deeper and have an open conversation about that real quick. Um, I think that's a wonderful practice is when somebody comes on board, one of your very first conversations is just getting to know them. Wh what are you comfortable with? How do you work best? I'm so, so glad you're here. Welcome to the team. Now let's get to know each other and make sure that we are communicating effectively. Um, in addition to training you and onboarding you to our company, we are in a way getting onboarded to you, the person. And, and that needs to be a mutual exchange early on. Alex, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, your comments on this. Yeah, thanks, Erin. Um, I love to hear it. I mean, I think that the, the biggest thing that we all want you all to walk away with today, that it doesn't have to be grand gestures. It can just be like a phone call, like for, for Aaron, right? Like they were able to figure out, you know, maybe Aaron likes Reese's Pieces and like they had, they sent her a care package, like who knows, right? Like it, it could be so simple. Um, and I just, I love this example because you know, if Erin is a is a visual learner, like they're obviously not going to send her podcasts, right? Like, or or just like getting her preferences is just such a nice way to like acknowledge and see someone for who they are. So, I definitely um, appreciate all of these uh, these comments, and I just saw one from Chris too. Um, yeah, playing games via Teams, like it's just like it's so simple, and like if you have something like. Um, trying to think of the games platform that that I use all during the the pandemic um uh when we all would just get on and we would play as a team and it was super fun right um and it could be even sporkle I've seen teams that that have done like a one minute sporkle game before a retrospective and like that was just super fun jackbox games yes like this does not have to be a, a big grand gesture and um you know I'm 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 hemming and hawing now, so uh, <laughs> uh, Zach, this is great. Back over to you. I just want to preach that. That absolutely. That <laughs> Please keep those keep those coming in the chat. We're, we're gonna Alex and I will be make a point to read through these, even if we don't get to address all of them during this live uh, webinar. Uh, we would love to be able to read back through these and learn from your experiences. So please continue to, to keep that coming uh, as we continue through the presentation. We've got one more question on this. <laughs> <laughs> What's the easiest way to create psychological safety? I think um, it's what we've been saying is it's small moments. It, um, so I guess there is a class of easier that we could say just in, in being intentional about um, when you're thinking about how the culture you want to establish or, or maintain, um, looking for those opportunities uh, in the smallest of ways. So uh, it can be um, like what we've done here with, our, uh, with this session, inviting Amanda to be a part of this, uh, making sure that Amanda was um, a partner. And it's not, it shouldn't seem out of the ordinary. It should just be part of how you work. And that's how we work at Propeller. Uh, but um, if that's not present, um, or if you notice it lacking in a, a certain environment, 
being the one who speaks up to say, should we consider this? Uh, can we open the floor for maybe an opposing opinion uh, would be another opportunity. Uh, and being willing to allow people to disagree without being disagreeable um, I, as another I would classify that in the easier category of making sure that you open the floor for those types of opportunities. Alex, real quick before we go to the next slide, what do you think? Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Sarah. I think the one thing that pops up into my head is just like actively listening and like retaining information on people. And like, you know, when I first started, uh, you know, one of my jobs, like I had a dog and one of the senior leaders like always would ask me about the dog. Right. And like always like take a vested interest in like how I was doing. And so like by just listening to people and like making them feel heard, I think that that is such an easy way like if you hear something in a meeting and it's like, oh, my kid is sick. Like, you know, I always try to like check up, like, you know, with the person and say, hey, how's your kid doing? Like, are they okay? Like, I know that that, you know, you, you know, there was something, you know, fever. I think that happened to me yesterday. I checked back in with a colleague when I saw them in the office. Um, just And then they were like, oh my gosh, like you remembered. Like, that's like the easiest way. Um, in my opinion. And then also one more thing before I move on, I am loving seeing all of these tools that everyone is putting in the in the chats as well. I think that, um, you know, what's something that's really insightful for me is like, we've all navigated this in different ways. We've all had different ways of doing things. And I just think that, um, you know, you have to be genuine to like what your, your culture is. And, and you know what, like, if, if this is not something that you're doing today, like, you can, you, all you have to do is just start, right? Like just start to start. Um, but um, yeah, Zach, I'll pass it back over to you. <laughs> this is great. Uh, by the way, Alex and I are going to be participating in an HR.com roundtable in the spring, and we're looking forward to this type of interaction, uh, continuing this conversation on topics like this. So please keep the questions coming. Please keep the tool recommendations coming. And uh, we'll move into some case studies here so you can see other examples of real world practice of these five dimensions of belonging. So this is Lauren. Uh, Lauren is a manager of content and strategy at Hubble Communications. And outside of work, she loves making charcuterie boards. Uh, it's a side hustle. It's not intended to be her full-time job. It's just something she likes to do on the side. This uh, center post here is a screenshot from her LinkedIn, where back in February of this year, she was saying how she has the full support of her managers to go and pursue this passion of hers. It's around Valentine's Day. Her business is going to be in higher demand. Take the day, make the most of it, lean into that passion of yours, and she feels comfortable bringing her whole self to work because she has that support from her staff. She's still going to get her work done. She's still committed to her full-time job, but this allows her to have that moment because her leadership understands that this is important to her, and they want her to have that opportunity to, to grow and excel there. So how does somebody, the question becomes, how does somebody get to this point? We, we talked about um, the culture of a business. How does somebody get to the point that they feel comfortable posting something like this and mentioning that, by the way, my company supports me in doing this? Well, you see that this post was made nine months ago. But if we go to the next slide, we see a post from three months prior to that. We see a post by a gentleman named Zach Heider, and I'll summarize what he says here. Uh, it's, it's, he's basically saying that it's important to him how people are welcomed at Hubble Communications and that they want to encourage a spirit of entrepreneurship and they want to encourage people to lean into their passions. And, and when somebody comes on board, we want to make them feel a part of our group. So what Zach did is he tied together Lauren's, Lauren by name, Lauren's passion, promoting her company and the fact that they've got an on, somebody onboarding, tying all that together into welcoming this, this new person to the team. And I want you to look to the right. We've got those five dimensions of belonging that Alex taught us about earlier. Can you see in some of the language that Zach used how those dimensions are present in the language that he's, he's provided in that post? If we go to the next slide, we've called some of those out for you a little bit brighter. So we see inviting and welcoming. We see that Lauren was invited to participate in this uh, activity. They're, we're welcoming people to the team. We know that Lauren is working on this as a leadership team. We're ex accepting of that. We're excited about that. And we want to celebrate that alongside her participating and contributing. So we've asked Lauren to participate in the welcoming of a, a staff member. Uh, we're participating in her business if we're the leadership that's purchasing the, the charcuterie board. And we're contributing, making sure that she has the opportunity to grow uh, from this experience. So we see all of those elements present in this particular situation. And I love what Zach said here in the middle, small moments like this matter in big ways. It's like we said earlier, it doesn't have to be a grand event. You, you're going to welcome this person to your organization anyways. 
mapping towards that moment to say, what can I do to make it a little more special? What can I do to lean into somebody's passion and celebrate here, two people at the same time? What, what an amazing way to do that. Those are those deposits that we talked about earlier. That's a small deposit in that piggy bank of what is your culture. And so I think that he hit the nail on the head with that statement. Small moments like this matter in big ways. And by the way, he's not just a colleague uh, of Lauren's. Uh, he is actually the president of Hubble Communications. So we see the culture starting at, that top, at the top and, and making its way through the whole organization. So I thought this was a great example of um, what we've talked about, those five dimensions of belonging in practice. And this is more of a maybe in-person uh, option or a hybrid if the person is local. You might say, well, what do I do if my person, I can't deliver a, a locally made charcuterie board? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take another look, a different look at a, a new case study. Uh, this one is going to be with Rosie. Uh, in this LinkedIn post, Rosie shares with the world that she's proud of her culture and her heritage. She attributes her love of cooking to her late mother and that many of her mother's recipes were never written down. They actually live on in, in her memory. And before we get into what Rosie even does for a job, just thinking about Rosie the person, if this was somebody on your team, what could you do as a leader or a colleague to celebrate Rosie's passion in a meaningful way in a hybrid environment? So we're going to take a moment. I think we still got, we've got time to work on this. Just a couple comments. What could you do to celebrate Rosie, to honor her culture, her heritage, uh, what she's passionate about? What are some thoughts that come to mind there? Amanda, if you could be the voice of our audience. Mm -hmm. and, and other things to consider, too, are our, lever, our levers of design, right? Like, what ways mm -hmm. can we communicate? What objects? What, what type of spaces can we create? Um, roles, rituals. Um, and there are no right or wrong answers to these things. I think that's the beauty of creating these types of moments, um, that as long as you make the person feel like they are like they matter that's that's it that's all that it that it is so um you know just reflecting on those levers and then also the elements um we would love to see what you would do if rosie was on your team absolutely amanda any responses coming in not yet thinking on it still here we go an employee highlight story Mm -hmm. Well, it, feel free to drop in other suggestions. We'll go into this particular case study in a little bit more detail here on the next slide. In this particular case, uh, Rosie was invited uh, to lead a cooking session during Hispanic Heritage Month. There was already a planned virtual lunch and learn, uh, but she was asked to come and uh, share some of that cooking that she was so passionate about. Uh, she was able to teach uh, colleagues how to make ceviche over Zoom. And in addition to that, the company sent everyone out a DoorDash gift card so that you could buy your main course from a locally owned business, um, minority owned if you so chose, and you could participate in the cooking lesson, eat your lunch, learn about uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, learn from Rosie herself on cooking. It was a great way to combine uh, her, her culture, uh, her love of cooking, her late mother's memory, um, and it was, it was uh, great to be a part of. This picture actually is, is my picture. I uh, ordered fajitas that day. That's uh, kombucha on the side. But it was great to participate in Rosie's cooking lesson. And I think the company did a wonderful job incorporating some of those dimensions of belonging, again, listed on the right, in making sure that we're celebrating the person, celebrating what's important to them, helping them bring their whole self to work, knowing that they belong, they are welcome, and we want to celebrate them and the things that are important to them. So... Now let's talk about, well, it, it's great that you've got somebody who has a passion for charcuterie boards or maybe somebody who wants to be on Zoom and help uh, teach a course, but what if you've got uh, somebody who wants to be celebrated in more subtle ways? How could we work through uh, thinking about those types of personas? And with that, Alex is going to walk us through an exercise. Awesome. Um, and I, uh, I love all of the, um, the chatter in the chat as well. Um, so... Let's put it into practice. So uh, we've learned a lot today. We've gone through a lot of content, um, but now we want you to apply uh, those learnings um, to three uh, personas that you might recognize. And, and so what we would love for you all to do is to take a moment. You can pick one of the personas. You can pick, you know, you can mix two of them. But like, what would you do to honor these folks based off of what you know? Um, and we actually like 
we did kind of a little bit of a case study with you all because we we introduced ourselves and gave you some input from us like very early on um, to make you feel kind of welcomed, inviting, you know, et cetera. Um, so we've been kind of, you know, experimenting as we go. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear how you would honor any of these folks. And remember the lovers of design too. Ah, yes, ask about my border collie, totally. I could totally put together a PowerPoint on Finn if anyone wanted that, which might be my next HR.com special. Um, <laughs> um, company sponsored hikes for Amanda, 100%. Ask Alex to perform comedy, that has definitely been a request. Um, <laughs> um, Ask Alex to lead a pizza ranking. Um, I love these ideas, and we'll be sending all of this to our Propeller Social Committee for uh, for all of us. Um, Zach, yep, go for a run with Zach. Uh, if I was in Portland, uh, I think Zach would have to make sure that I made it through the, the run. Um, yeah, company sponsorship for Zach. I mean, there's so many things. Some people from Propeller could go cheer on Zach with, a, you know, whatever you wanted, right? Um, send Alex a pizza making kit. I love this so much. Excellent. Craft night with Amanda for sure. Um, go to one of Alex's comedy improv gigs. Hundred um, percent. I also see in the Q and A. Can you host hybrid events such as an in person Christmas party while some staff attend virtually? So, I mean. I've definitely seen, and Zach, I would love your thoughts on this too. I've definitely seen an all virtual Christmas party. Um, that's something that we did through the pandemic. Um, we had a magician uh, and it was it was very fun um, and some raffles or, you know, trivia, et cetera. Um, but I mean, you, you definitely could. I, I think that the world is your oyster. Like whatever you want to do, like there's no right or wrong answer to doing this type of stuff. If, I would just encourage that you do it and you think about it because, you know, you might be, um, you know, your company might be located in, you know, New Mexico, but you might be in Pennsylvania. So, you know, how do you make that happen? Um in a way that like that it's not just, you know, somebody may be seeing people eating like on Zoom, right? Like um, just making it intentional and like, you know, if it's going to be like maybe a, I don't know, you could do any sort of event or games or et cetera. Um, Zach, would love to hear your thoughts. I've seen some interesting technology incorporated into hybrid uh, remote attendance for an in-person event. So they, uh, depending on budget and if this is of interest, uh, they make these robots uh, with like an iPad. It's similar to what you showed earlier with the um, elderly gentleman speaking to his family, uh, but it's something you can control remotely. So it'll have a tablet up top, it'll have your video screen present, and you can drive it around uh, from your computer while the robot attends the in-person event. And it's something that people could have designated time to log into and be able to go around the venue and talk face-to-face -face with, with, well, tablet to face <laughs> with people um, at the party. It's an interactive element that makes it more uh, three-dimensional so that you're not just at a, a static camera position. Uh, so that's one, one way that I've seen uh, hybrid be more interactive and um, allow the remote people to step into, in some way, the uh, in-person event. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I see, I see in the chat, um, I, I love um, that we're talking about the generic name for the event instead of Christmas. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, I love the sentiment about winter or holiday or, you know, because at the end of the day, like you want to make everyone feel welcomed, right? Like if I don't celebrate Christmas, I, I don't want to go to the Christmas party, right? Um, so, you know, being really creative about how you market things to people. Um, I know Amanda would uh, would appreciate my marketing reference um, is important. And like, that's the whole thing. Like, I think that there needs to be a lens of empathy when you're thinking about designing these types of things, right? Like what, like think about the group of people that you're, you're, you know, going to be planning for. And then as, as Zach said before, um, it, you know, design for who who they are like if they're an introvert extrovert like make sure that you have moments and experiences that aren't going to put people on the spot um or make people uncomfortable um so yeah i appreciate um all everything in the chat and uh you know for time's sake um i think uh we will move on 
Okay, so just to do a recap with everybody of of where we've been um, and kind of your next steps, like what what's next after this after this session. So we went through and talked about the Stanford K twelve lab um, study on belonging, and we made that critical link between children and adults when it comes to belonging. Then we talked through a little bit about how to intentionally design for belonging. And we also have another like addendum for you uh, for things to think about um, in the PDF file as well. So um, of course, feel free to use that. Then we went through the case studies and we did the exercise. Um, we also talked a little bit about resources. Again, we have so many resources for you in the backup. Um, and now it's time for you to like to go forth and and try. Um, I would say like start small, do little things. They don't have to be grand, as we always are saying. Like, but the the most important thing that you can do is is just start. Oh, that's great. I wish you had more time, folks. Alex, Zach, Amanda, fantastic presentation. Uh, I feel like I felt a sense of belonging and seeing the comments that come in, I could see that sentiment that everyone felt a sense of belonging. So thank you so very much for leading that way.